joke at the beginning, right, so that we're all relaxed, but I think I'll just start. So I'm curious to know, because this is a journalism conference, how many of you are journalists or aspiring journalists? Some. And then give me an idea of what, what else the people in the room do. Do any of you, are you involved in NGOs or you're working writers? Photographers? A photographer? You say, oh, that's a good one. Any other? Advertising. Advertising, good. So you like to know about branding. So this is a little bit of a different topic, and we're going to talk about it in a different way. So that I'm going to take you through kind of the analytic basis of how brands are constructed, right? Because most people are confused about what a brand is. I find that most people, when they call me, right, because I'm a brand consultant and I have a communications business, they call me and they say, my website is not working. I don't like my website. Or they say, my marketing's not working. Or they have all kinds of other things. My social media isn't working. So I found, ah, that's what I forgot. Um, one second. Um, I, had an, I had a couple of interesting conversations yesterday where I was talking about branding and the only thing that people wanted to talk about was social media. So social media is a tool of branding. So first we're going to establish kind of the ground zero of what a brand is about in a very deep way. And then I have a lot of case studies and I'm actually going to ask you questions. So don't, get, don't be afraid. Like, don't be afraid to answer my questions because it will let me know if I'm helping you guys to become good analysts. Because in order to build your own brand, you have to learn how to analyze the marketplace. That's the first skill you're going to develop. Okay, and because I'm speaking in American, I'm going to call you all you guys, okay? okay. So, <laughs> good. Now, I'm starting here because this is an, I'm going to show you a couple of quotes of people that I've worked with. Now, this is an agency that I work with in New York that represents a lot of photographers. And the agent said, there's always room for growth. Why not aspire for greatness? Now, someone else says going through the branding process is, um, it's like having a psychotherapist for your career, a chiropractor for your mind, and a GPS, a navigation device for your heart. So another person says, let go of your familiar words so you can understand your mother tongue, your own language. That is what your brand is, your own language. It's an unconventional, unexpected offering to observe your past, your present, and thereby ultimately help define your future. Okay, so tell me if I'm speaking too fast, but we, we have plenty of time, so. Now, every artist wants to grow and be challenged. This is someone I've been working with for years, and he says, or at least they say they do, but it's hard to find the tools in life to continue to make strides and get to the next level. I did not have a framework to understand how my life had informed my work and vice versa. But through this work, I was given the tools and insight to understand and control why I am making the creative decisions that I make. So this is where we're starting, you guys. Right here, okay? So I'm calling this Branding 101, but we're gonna be talking about things at a much deeper level. So what does it mean to define your brand and then bring it to market? Okay, so let's start here. What is a brand anyway? 
most people are confused about what a brand is. They think having a brand is tacky, you know, and self-promotional, and um, or that brands are only about logos, websites, or social media. Now, I've been asked many times to write a book, but I find books about branding so irritating because this is what people talk about, whereas we're going to talk about what brands are really made of. And you're going to see, while I'm speaking, I'm always going here or here. Your gut and your heart married with your brain. That's your brand. Okay, so in reality, your brand is your voice. It's your point of view. It's your inner life. It's your history and your hopes and dreams. And it's the work you create and the work that you do. This is your brand, okay? So it's the first piece. You can't market or advertise or do any of those things unless you have sorted out this front piece. Okay, so when you work from your center, this is gonna be a lot of talking in the beginning, then it'll be really visual, okay? So when we talk about becoming a brand, we're talking about coming from what I call the you of you your internal essence, and what that is comprised of. And then we're talking about how you run your business, or let's say you're a freelancer, how you run your career. And then if you're a filmmaker or a writer, what you create and how you approach the creative process. Now, your belief systems, in other words, this authentic self, it's a combination of your feelings, your psychology, it's analysis, right? Because it's deductive, because you have to be analytic in the marketplace. Sometimes it's spiritual, sometimes people are bringing a spiritual dimension to who they are and what they do. And then sometimes it's aesthetic, if you're in the visual part of the business. Can you hear all right, even though there's trucks passing? Yeah, I think it's okay, okay. So this is part of everything that you create, you make, and you do. Now this is what I call learning how to communicate consciously, all right? It doesn't matter whether you're a journalist, a photographer, you have an organization, so you all do different things. So that's what I find so interesting in my line of work. Um, no matter who I work with, whether it's a nonprofit or a food company, or an artist, or an agency, or a photographer, we're always going through the same process, and then the outcome is different. But the process of doing this excavation work is always the same. So I want you all to realize that this applies to you, no matter who you are and what you do. Okay, so by bringing these elements to the surface, it enables you to use all aspects of yourself more consciously and to express yourself, who you are, and then come to market more successfully. Okay. So I think a good way to talk about it to yourself is to have conscious communications. So what I say is you, com you commun learn to communicate with yourself differently and then you learn to communicate with the market differently. And that will change how your business or your career unfolds. Okay, so why does branding matter? This is, this is a good question, right? So it creates a sense of purpose and focus for all of your activities, no matter what they are. It helps you to communicate clearly and understandably about what you're offering in the marketplace. Now you communicate to yourself and all of your audiences. The thing is, you guys, your audience is not monolithic. It's not one audience, it's many audiences. And you have to learn to communicate with all those people, okay? Now, Branding is good because it helps you to increase sales. It allows you to be strategic. It allows you to work from the center out. It helps you to attract and retain clients. So whether you're a freelancer or you have a company, whatever it may be, you have to bring people in the door who are gonna pay for your service. 
unless you're independently wealthy. So that's another story. But you still need a brand because then you can create something and birth it into the world. Then this final piece, which I think is really important, is that it teaches you how to use your resources because we all have a limited amount of resources, right? Whether it's time or money or the people that we work with. So, right, because you can't work 24 hours a day and you don't have an endless amount of money. And sometimes you're not working on your own either. Okay, now I'm going to show you this really interesting chart. So for any of you who are already working, this is going to change your thinking a little bit, I feel, and I hope. This is how your audiences relate to you. Now, most people who I speak to think that your audience relates to you based on your skill. In other words, what you do. I'm a car mechanic, or I own a bakery, or I'm a photographer. But that is not how they relate to you. That's not the first piece. The first piece is about perception. So this is how your audience experiences you and perceives you, your work, and your business. So you guys know what perception is? Yeah. It's not a fact. It's an impression. And sometimes it's right, and sometimes it's really, really wrong. But keep in mind that the way what I'm going to show you is because this is the first piece you want to be able to have an accurate perception out in the marketplace. In addition, there's the relationship piece. This is what people like to call relationship, relationship marketing. But really what it's about is the relationship between you and your audience. How do you handle the relationship? How every aspect of the relationship in addition, it's your reputation. What are people saying about you? That can be a painful thing to think about for all of us. You know, maybe people think, oh, that person is showy, or that person's a braggart, or that person thinks they're talented, but they're really not. What, whatever it is that they're saying about you, you need to pull these pieces together in order to handle your brand properly. And last but not least, is what you make or do. So do you guys see that's not at the top of the list, it's at the bottom of the list. So it's perception, relationship, reputation, and then it's your category, your skill. Okay, so just hang in with me in getting through the groundwork piece because it'll get juicier as we go along. So your capabilities are what you do. I'll give you an example. A Mac is a computer. And as a company, one thing that Apple does is make computers. In addition, they have attributes. So what is an attribute? Now, I have these shocking experiences where I might be working with someone for a year, and then they come back after a year and they say, what is an attribute? So an attribute is a trait or a characteristic. So a good way to practice this is describe your uncle, right? So my uncle Joe, he's very funny, he's very loyal, and he's extremely, extremely friendly. I have described his brand. So that's a, that's a trait, that's an attribute. Okay, so an attribute is how you do it. So how, how does Apple do it? For example, a Mac is well designed. That's one way that they do it. But how else do they do it? What do you guys think? How else is Apple doing it? This is a question. Anybody have a thought? Is Mac is thin. Fine. Thin. 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 Ah, right. So that's well designed. That's right. 
But what else? They do what? Uh, they, um, I don't know the right word. Mm, to fidelize, I don't know. <laughs> they care. They about care their about their customers. customers. <laughs> that's right. I would agree that's true. But what, what's the really important thing about them? Right? They're not a PCs. What, what did they do? All these things that you take for granted in your iPhone and in your computer is they made it, they were visionary enough so that everything feels intuitive. It's not clunky, right? It feels really, really good to use your iPhone, okay? So that is their brand. The fact is that it's thin, it's beautiful. That is all built into the bigger idea of the meaning level of what this brand is about. So this is a good brand to study, you guys, because it's extremely, extremely well managed. So both are uh, important, they're married together. You can't take one piece or the other piece. They're, they're merged together. Okay. Now, I'm going to bring this up to you because this is the things that people say to me. This is what they tell me a brand is. They say a brand is what you do or make. In other words, I make, I build houses or I'm a plumber, but that's not my brand. But that's what they tell me. Or they say, I'm working on my brand. I'm redoing my logo. So your logo is not your brand. It's a tool that you use to express your brand. Your brand is not your name, but your name should express your brand. Right? That's one piece of your brand. So you want to be known for the combination of elements that comprise your, your POV, your point of view, or brand. OK. We'll get, we're going to get through all this dry stuff. We're almost through it. So brands have to be relevant, right? So if you're not relevant, who cares? You're going to claim something that isn't going to matter to people. So it's really, really important. You know, I used to work with someone who um, was a still life photographer, and he really just wanted to be a travel photographer because he was sick of being in the studio. But it didn't have any meaning for his clients whatsoever. So in, in order to kind of fulfill that yearning, he built a whole fine art career. And then that allowed him to be in the gallery and meeting with clients and having openings. And it dimensionalized his work. So you want to be relevant. You want to be distinctive. Now, there's this crazy word that's used in the branding business, which is called differentiation. It's a terrible word. It's really bad. But what it means is how are you different from the person standing next to you who does exactly the same thing, right? Because you're not working in a little box. You're working in a world where there's many, many people who have the same skill set or the same kind of business that you have. So you need to be different to claim your difference, just, just like Apple did. Like, I don't know if you had here in Italy the campaign that Apple did um, that was called Think Different. Okay. So they were claiming that about themselves, but they were calling you to see yourself as part of their tribe. That's why it was so powerful. So I don't think a PC could make that claim, but I am biased. Nobody's getting my jokes. OK, you have to be credible. In other words, you want to claim something that's believable. You don't want to say something that people are going to think, ugh, that's not, that's not legitimate. And lastly, you want, as you build your brand, to build something that is sustainable now and in the future. And um, this is interesting. I'll, I'll tell you just a little story about someone that I've worked with for years. So he was my student when I used to live in California. And then I used to do these small workshops for young people. And he came into that workshop. 
And then he became, he was a photographer, became a private client. And then um, from there, he decided that he would open a gallery. So he became a gallerist in Chelsea in New York. And then he became the dean of one of the fine arts schools in New York. He's a very ambitious guy. And now he is the primary art consultant to the Russian government. But what I want to say about him is he uses the same attributes in everything that he does. So in the time I've known him, he's already had six different careers. But he is always talking about his attributes. Just so you can see, it doesn't matter. Like maybe now you're a journalist, and then in 10 years you want to open a gelato shop. You're going to use the same material in yourself. Okay, this is the other really, I have three important charts. So this is the second one. You excited? Okay. This is where you are right now, your reality. Now the thing about your reality is that your reality is real to you. That's really where you are. Maybe you're working on your own in a basement, making very little money. But here, here's the interesting piece. There's this piece back here, which is where your audiences think you are. And you see that little hole in the center? Usually, at the time when you start working on your brand, there's a hole between what they think about you and your reputation and where they think you are and where you actually are, for better or worse. Because they might think that you're having like, um, you know, running around the world drinking champagne with everyone, having a blast, when in fact, you're in the basement trying to figure out how to fix your computer on your own. So you want to pull those things together. So this is the key piece. You want to end up here. Where you want to be is to pull these two pieces together, your reality, your reputation, what people think about you, and pull them together so they meet your aspirations and you can move forward. Okay, here's my other important chart. So there's you and your attributes. What happens after that? There's the definition and whatever that may be. If you're a photographer, it's about your images. A writer, it's about your work. What, whatever that may be, the definition, the facts of what you do. Then you have to communicate that. So it's your attributes, <clears throat> which leads to the definition. Coming out of the communication is your name, because some people use their own name and some don't. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then there's what we call in the design field your identity. It's not your logo, your identity, which is the symbolic expression of your facts and feelings, right? It's an important, important expression, expressive piece. Then you have to come to market. So I've given you an example of some of the places that you touch when you come to market. Maybe you're a photographer, you're working on your portfolio, you have social media, marketing, collateral, advertising, your website. What I want you to see is based on this conversation I had with someone yesterday, we're all the way down here. The brand is at the top. All these elements come in a very orderly fashion out of this central brand identification. I think I'm almost at the end of these slides. So in the branding business, every well-managed brand has one of these. This is called a brand pyramid. So the bottom of the brand doesn't matter at all. Like one of my favorite things is everybody tells me that they're a problem solver or that they're responsible. Those are base attributes to be a working professional in any business. You cannot sell to them. So the only thing that matters to us are these things at the top of the pyramid, the, the peak attributes. Because the peak attributes are the three or four attributes that you are going to form inside, inside, and create everything around those attributes. 
Now, before you leave today, I'm going to give you some exercises to do, and you're welcome to do them if you like, or if you don't want to do them on your own. I left my card outside. Now, I will say, because I can't cover everything here, I do like to send a little follow-up afterwards. So if you guys take my card or leave me your card, we send you a, a sheet of some information about branding, if you would like to have it. OK. So now we're going to have a little interactive piece. Don't be scared. I'm going to ask you questions. So the most successful brands have a clear message. I know that IKEA is here in Italy because I checked. What is this brand about? You tell me. What are their attributes? Have you ever been to IKEA? Yeah. OK. So you all have the IKEA experience. It's the same all over the world. What is it? Designed for a reasonable price. Yes. And um, a nice living. A nice say. living, yes. But what about that design for a reasonable price? What else about it? Mm. Anybody? Mm. Ooh. OK, I have to sp a half an hour? OK. What else? Come on. I know that all of you have struggled with some aspect of this brand. What is it? You have to build it yourself, right? It makes you want to pull your hair out. Do, right? It's a do-it-yourself brand. It's affordable, it's to yourself, but the other side of it is that it for the length of your life. You buy it and then when it gets a little knocked up, you buy something else. How about this, the Olympics? What is this about? Anyone? Anyone interested in or, or aware of the Olympics? <laughs> Uh, the Olympic Games, that's right. I think maybe push you. Oh, Try to give me the attributes. I think maybe push yourself to the limit. Absolutely. It, it's, it's your personal best. What else? Internationally. Absolutely. Perfect. Anything else? Are they new? Well, they've been running around with that torch for a long time. It's historical, that's right. So they're preeminent, they're competitive, exactly your personal best, enduring, so that's important, and very comprehensive. You know, in the Winter Olympics, they started bringing that curling in. Did any of you guys see that, where you push this big thing along the ice on the floor? And then all these clubs started in Canada for people who wanted to do that crazy sport. How about Mercedes? Tell me. <laughs> Looks, definitely. Looks. Expensive, that's a fact. What, what else is it known for? Style of life. Style of life. Absolutely. In a special style of life. Definitely. I think I have to speed up, so I'm going to tell you. It's about engineering. It's always the mixture of style and engineering, and that's what they stand on. You watch their commercials, you guys. Now that we've talked about these things, think about them when you're experiencing brands. Like, I've given you a lot of information. I'm going to run through this. Has anyone been to the Saatchi Gallery in London? No. OK. You should go there. This is what it looks like. It's in the Duke of Wellington's headquarters. Um, it's one of the most visited museums in the UK. It was started from a personal collection, and now it's become the National um, Modern Design Museum, the National Modern Art Museum, Contemporary Art Museum of, um, of the UK. Um, this is their gallery, but they were the first people, certainly in the UK and the US, who created an area where you could buy the work of uh, like a clearinghouse for the work of artists all over the world to sell. 
to put their bios up, and they have very, very brisk sales. So it's art for everyone. It's very interesting. And they're very committed to young artists and young British artists. This is their site. So let's see, they've already sold, just in 2012, they sold $100 million worth of art through that website. So I'm sure it's a lot more now. I'm talking about a brand like this because you can study a museum here. You can study a museum anywhere. This, everywhere you go is material for you to analyze what it means. This is the Saatchi uh, uh, Roundup where they go through the artists who are on the site and they tell you, the curators say, These are, this is the art we love right now. For those of you who are interested in art and who are interested in the online world, I would encourage you to look at this. So this is how one of the artists display their work. I tell you, I've gotten sucked in where I think, oh my God, I should buy a piece of art here. Oh, I'm going backwards, okay. So I've given you their attributes. So when you look at their website, you can tell me what you think. It's contemporary, they were groundbreaking, they're springboard for young artists, they're cutting edge, they're very controversial in what they show. Uh, they're accessible because it's all free and they have a very, all the artists on that site come from all over the world and they show art from all over the world. So it's now the Mu UK Museum of Contemporary Art. Okay, now this is an artist who you won't know, but I'm going to show you these pictures so you can see what feeling you get from them. Okay, this is from some of her personal work. So this is a family at home. And it's not, it's not models, these are real people at home. Okay, so just think about that. So it's, it's not, and it's not portraiture. So she has her own category. This is a very famous picture of hers taken, uh, her name is Tina Barney, another person, photographers in the room who you might want to look at. She's having a huge resurgence of interest in her work. So, Look at what's going on in this family, you guys. What does it look like? Do they look like warm and fuzzy, really involved with each other, either of these families? No. How about this family? There's a connecting thread, you see, in the people who she photographs. What do they look like to you? Are they everyday people? That's right, people of privilege. So I'll tell you something interesting about her. She has a great gallerist that represents her in New York. She's been in tons of museum shows. This was a commission from the New York Times. Now, she photographs her own tribe. This is her background. She grew up on Park Avenue in Manhattan. She shoots people she knows or people who know, bless you, the people that she knows. So it's very tribal work. That's all that interests her. And in her world, people are not happy. There's, she is always photographing the disconnects between people. It's not a serene world. It's not like money makes you happy in this world. So it's very controlled. The work is extremely formal. Now, I'm showing it to you because I know that you wouldn't know her but you can see how the pictures connect. I didn't do an edit to skew it in this direction. I just found some pictures, some of which I knew, and I thought, all right, these would be interesting because you can see how they work as a brand, as a brand expression. Okay, I thought we would talk about a publication. Now, I know you have Vanity Fair here because I have clients who shoot for Italian Vanity Fair. Do you guys know this magazine? Yes, good, okay, so we can talk about this well. So this is historical from the early days of the, probably the 1920s or teens, and this is after Madonna had her face redone. So, you know, 
had all that plastic surgery, but there she is on the cover. Okay, so what does Vanity Fair mean? It's the social life of a community, especially of a great city or the world in general. So the social life of a community or the world in general. Okay, so this is FDR from uh, the 1940s. So the magazine has gotten incarnated a bunch of times. It starts in the 1800s. It's always about the upper class or the people who were interested in them. Oops, that got screwed up. Okay, so I'll show you this. This is Edward Steichen, who's a really important photographer from the early part of the 20th century. And then this is a story that they ran about Picasso. So you guys know Picasso. Now, they promoted always the work of major artists like Picasso. They commissioned work from people like Gertrude Stein and Dorothy Parker. And they established in magazines the genre of celebrity portraiture that you take for granted now, that we're surrounded by. But this came from Vanity Fair. So then they, they seized publication in the 30s because of the Depression. They felt that people weren't interested in that topic or they didn't have the money to buy magazines. So then they come back in 1983 with Tina Brown from the UK. And it's this kind of very glittering combination of high and low culture sensational exposés about murders and it, people, drug addicts who are socialites and all kinds of things like that, and always a discussion of money. So it's really a reflection of its time. Now, Graydon Carter became the editor-in-chief in 1992. So it's still about this blend of high and low culture, but he expanded the places that the brand touches, right? Because remember, we looked at what happens when you communicate and implement your brand and bring it to market, right? You guys remember that, that chart. So they have these famous theme issues now, like the Hollywood issue or the power issue, and they have this famous Oscar party, which is the most, I don't even know, it's the party everyone wants to go to and the party everyone wants to read about. And if you're into celebrity, okay. Now, what they've done is shape the careers of many journalists and photographers. So if you think about some of the people who wrote for them, like Sebastian Junger or Christopher Hitchens, and then here we have Annie Leibovitz, and we have Bruce Weber. Do you guys know those photographers? The photographers do. The thing is, if you look at Italian Vanity Fair or you go online and you look at American Vanity Fair, you can see how this brand is constructed. So now when you go to the newsstand or when you're online, look and see if what I'm saying rings true for you because the brand is a very, very controlled brand. This is Graydon Carter, and he owns two restaurants, uh, three restaurants in Manhattan, and the only people who can get in the door are the powerful, the wealthy, and celebrities. Right? You cannot get a reservation to go to this restaurant. So it's just like the magazine. He created in the real world what is called a brand extension. Okay, so I'm saying it's cosmopolitan. It's insider in the sense, like I used to work for this magazine. It's always like someone was whispering the most exciting thing in your ear. And um, it's very glamorous. What they're showing is glamorous. It's in the know. It's very exuberant and kind of over the top. It's about the powerful and influential. And again, it's about high and low culture, and it celebrates celebrity in all, area, um, in all areas. So whether it's a picture of Jackie Kennedy, or Barack Obama, or Marilyn Monroe, or Mond Madonna, it's taking all of that to the same level of celebrity. So are you, are you guys with me? Okay. 
Now, I'm going to talk to you because we're at a journalism conference about a journalist. This is Lauren Greenfield. Do any of you know her work? Have you seen her movies or seen her? I'm going to show you some of her work. She went to Harvard, and um, she did not study to be either a journalist or a photographer, which is interesting because she's won a lot of major awards and has already had a number of important exhibitions. So. She has three monographs, four documentary films, she's made films for HBO, and she's published in a variety of media all over the world. Okay, so she says, I've never been interested in pretty pictures or pictures without contextual meaning about the way we live. Right, so there she's starting from number one position of people who are journalists. She says, when I went to college, I was not planning on doing anything in the visual arts. I started in social studies, which is a combination of economics and anthropology and sociology. In my third year of college, I went around the world studying visual anthropology, which is a really interesting concept. And that was a kind of life-changing year when I realized that my calling was to look at culture. And that is what she does uncompromisingly. I worked with her very early in her career and I commissioned her to do something actually for Entertainment Weekly, but it was totally based on where she was coming from. She had been a National Geographic Fellow and um, she'd had um, a lot of support from them in developing this important project that she did in LA. So these are two of the projects she's known for, Thin, which is all about kind of the epidemic of bulimia and um, what's the other, it just went out of my head. Uh, yes, and you know, the misconstrued body conceptions that young women have. Um, and then girl culture, and girl culture is, you know, very, very much an exploration of how these cultural stereotypes influence how girls punishingly look at themselves. But they're really, really, it's a great project. So I encourage you to, to look at her work. Now, one thing I want to show you about how she shows her own work is that she's always tying together all the pieces of how her work touches the world. It could be a commissioned story, let's say, for Vanity Fair. It could be a book or a monograph that she's published. It could be an exhibition, along with the film or the moving images that she creates in conjunction with her other work. So it's always holistic. Going back to what we talked about earlier, now you start to see how the analysis comes to life. She's working authentically from here. It's emotional, it's psychological, it's aesthetic. She feels it's her calling. It, it lands in this world of visuals and then she applies it in the world consistently, whether it's print or moving imagery. That's how it works, you guys. That's why we're going through this process. It's so you can understand how a person with a successful brand in a field that you might be in or a field that interests you brings themselves to market. Okay, these, I'm just, we're not gonna run through them all, but these are some of her exhibitions. She's been shown twice at the Annenberg Center for Photography. She's made films that are published by Chronicle Books, uh, rather, um, projects. And um, here is another major film. Now, was, I don't know if this was released here, called The Queen of Versailles. Did any of you see this? This is an incredible film. I'm sure that you can watch it online. Um, it won a ton of awards. It's about this family, this man named uh, David Siegel, who started the worldwide timeshare business. Do you know what timeshares are? Where you buy a week, like in a, uh, 
give me the word, like a, and, and then it's like you buy a week in a hotel and then that week belongs to you, but you can trade it. You're not really buying anything. You're just buying the, the right. But a lot of people spend a lot of money to buy timeshares. So you get a week, let's say, in Miami Beach once a year, or it's an apartment that's part of an apartment complex, and then you can trade it in and you could go to Rome for a week if you want to. But you don't actually own anything. So he became a billionaire, a billionaire based on this timeshare business. And um, he and his wife had been to Versailles and they decided to build the largest home in America. And it was beyond tacky. So this is his wife who has fake breasts and is absolutely crazy, but Lauren met them, and she was going to do a film about building the largest house in America. So you'll see what happens. So here they are. There's her fake boobs. I think that they have eight children. She says, Lauren, I've always been very much a purist in terms of the way I document. Nothing is set up. Nothing is manipulated. It's very different from the process we see in reality TV. So you have reality TV here, right? But this movie is crazier than reality TV. Like, you cannot believe it. Reality TV, uh, most of it is scripted. You know that, right? I'm not breaking anyone's heart by telling you that. OK, here she is. Look at their chair, which they think looks like Versailles. Scary. And um, this is where it becomes really interesting. Lauren says, I had an idea that the structure of the film was going to be about the building of the house. But they had to put it on the market because the market crashed in 2009. I realized that this was not a story about one family or even rich people. It was an allegory about the overreaching of America and really symbolic for what so many of us went through during the crash. So it became a metaphor for society. Therefore, it became much more in keeping with her other projects. You see how it works? It's one point of view. Then they decide to sue her. So they bring two lawsuits against her, both of which she won, and they had to pay her $750,000 in damages. So it's like 750,000 euros. Okay, now this commercial, if you have not seen, especially women in the room, you should watch this. You can watch it on YouTube. It's called a hashtag like a girl. And it's all about the stereotypes between, for example, how a girl runs and really how a girl now wants to run or how a girl throws a ball, but she really now can throw a power ball and she interviews these young women. So this, again, this commercial was shown at the Super Bowl. It has been viewed millions, millions, millions of times. It won every award that a commercial can win. It's been very, very influential in um, identifying a cultural moment. So that's what Lauren is great at, you guys, right? She is a cultural anthropologist. She is a sociologist. She's very empathetic. She's non-judgmental. She does not judge these young women who are eating themselves or not eating themselves to death, literally. 45 minutes in? Five minutes? Okay, we have a half hour. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Now, well, I made a little typo there. Her work is extremely incisive and to the point, but what she does have is not a finger on the zeitgeist, she has a finger on the zeitgeist. She has an incredible ability, like a, like a laser beam, to figure out what matters to people, what, because first she figures out what matters to her, her brand, that emotional, psychological calling, and then, her, the topic that moves her is usually a topic that's a bellwether for many, many other people. 
So are you guys following me? Okay. Okay, now I was told to do something for journalists, so I'm going to do a writer. Any writers in the room? Okay, a few. Okay, this is Adam Gopnik. Adam Gopnik, I love his writing. He's a staff writer for The New Yorker. He was their cultural critic, and then he wrote for them from France for many years. Um, he's won a ton of awards, and he's published a couple of unbelievably successful books. And he's also part of this thing called The Moth, which is a National Public Radio's radio hour, which you can listen to on your computer or your internet radio if you happen to have that. Okay, I, I thought that I would just read you a little bit of his writing so you could get a flavor of what his brand is about. Or read it for yourself. <laughs> But he says, when we got to the floor, that's the cafe floor in Paris, and looked around, upstairs and down, we couldn't find an empty table. It was that kind of Saturday. So we went outside and thought about where to go. I looked a little longingly at Les Deux Magots, just down the street on the Place Saint-Germain-des-Prés. The two cafes are separated only by the tiny, narrow Rue Saint-Benoît. I turned to Nicole and I said, why don't we just go in there? A smile, one of slight squeamishness mixed with incapacity, passed along Nicole's face. I don't know, she said, at a loss for the usual epigrammatic summary of the situation. We used to go there, I think, mm, 20 years ago. Her voice trailed off, and again, she got a funny smile on her face. She couldn't say why, but she knew that it was impossible. So... He's really laid his premise out here, right? Let's keep going. He says, a taboo as real as any that Malinowski studied among the Trobriand Islanders kept us out. The why it existed and how it kept its spell, I had no idea. Still, one of the things you learn if you live as a curious observer or as an observed curiosity on the fringes of the fashionable world in Paris is that the floor remains the most fashionable place in Paris, while the Dumago was long ago abandoned by people who think of themselves as belonging to the world. This country here, as the inhabitants of Versailles called their little fashionable island, somehow at some point in a past that was right around the corner, but to Nicole, at least, was irretrievable. Something had happened to make the Café de Flore the most fashionable place in Paris, and the Dumago the least. So I'm going to move through this quickly. This is a laugh-out-loud story he wrote, which you can read on the website of The New Yorker, called Bread and, Wom and Women, which is about why he's a great cook, but he's never tried baking. And when he decides that he needs to learn how to bake, he calls his mother, who lives almost like on a, out in the countryside in Canada, which shockingly to him is um, a three-hour drive from the airport and therefore an impossible place to go. So then this one is extremely funny which is all about how he and his son, his son would come home from school every day and Adam writes at home. And he would always ask his son how his day one went and his son would never tell him how the day was. So finally, he and his son started um, texting each other rather than speaking so that his son would, would text him from his room and um, Adam would text him from his room, and then his son would always sign his text with LOL, which Adam thought meant lots of love. And so he started putting that on the end of every text that he sent out. So he would say to someone, I'm so sorry your cat died, LOL. Or it's terrible. Or he would say, I'll see you at the funeral, LOL, because he thought he was sending lots of love to everyone instead of laugh out loud. So what is it about this man? 
He's extremely funny. I find when I read him, I laugh out loud. I literally laugh out loud. But part of what he's doing is he's always referencing the past. He's a curious observer. He's extremely cultured. He says you cannot write about the present without understanding the past. So he has a brand voice, right? He's an essayist. He's a journalist. He's won awards for doing journalism. Therefore, what is this brand about, you guys? Do you see what I'm saying? It's different from another writer. It's his brand. OK, so your brand attributes go from your safety zone to your greatest aspiration. It helps you to focus not just on who you are now, but who you want to become and how you want to grow. So remember, your voice, your point of view, is your inner life, it's your history, your hopes and dreams, and what you create. Married with how you run your business, whether you're a freelancer or you own a business, the market you are in and the markets you would like to be in. So I'm reminding you. How do you begin? So here's a couple of little assignments for you if you would like to try this on your own. You get yourself a nice a book to write in, not your computer, a writing book. You write by hand. And you sit down and you write about your goals and your dreams and where you are right now with your career, with your creativity, if you're in a creative field. You have to be honest when you start this writing exercise. It's not like, do you guys have um, online dating here? Right, where you meet people online and go out for a date, and then you write, you know, I like to go to the beach, and I like a walk in the woods, and I like moonlight, and I like candles. That's not how you write. You write honestly where you confront who you are, right? This place, this place, and this place. Once you do this, you find that a layer of, you know, we all have that chatter in our brain, like you should do this, and you should be going there, and you, things you should take care of. It moves that layer off the top so you can start to get to the real meaning level. Remember when you're writing, there's the split between where you are, where your audiences think you are, and where you want to be. Now, the other thing as you're starting to think about defining your brand and bringing your brand to market is you need a team. So I say, this is my team. They're really cute. You know, maybe this is the right team for you or not. But you need to develop relationships with people who share your attributes. In other words, they have to share your vision, and they help you create your brand, and then they help you take your brand to market and maintain your brand. So who could these people be? They're graphic designers, they're brand strategists like me, they're web designers. Maybe you need a grant writer, an accountant, an office manager. It could be anyone. Maybe you're working with your husband or wife, but you have to have your vision in common in order to bring your, your brand to market. OK, I like this illustration because you'll see that he only has three balls in the air. So research studies show you can only keep two or three initiatives in the air any given year. So what I do is in December, I take the, a week and I think, what have I done this year? What have I accomplished? Where do I want to put my time, resources, and personnel for the following year? And then I make a plan. And this is what all my clients do. So this is what you should do. Because if you give yourself too many things to do every year, you will blow yourself out. It just does not work. And then you feel bad about yourself, and that's not good. OK, now, as a strategist, I have to say to you that research is extremely important. So this is a dartboard. A dart board. Now, you need to do realistic research. What markets are you in now, today? What can you legitimately claim now? And then, who is what I say appropriately aspirational? 
Like sometimes I, ha I work with people who right now they're shooting, let's say, on s for Popular Mechanics magazine, a little magazine not so interesting, but they want to do the cover of Vanity Fair or Vogue. And that's a big leap, right? You need it to be l like steady and methodical about how you're going to move into the marketplace. Now be specific in using your attributes. Remember, when we looked at the brand pyramid, you have a group of attributes. So when you're editing or writing or creating or whatever you're doing, you have to use the whole group of attributes. I find that people get, fall in love with one attribute and everything they do is just that one attribute. And that is a flat brand, that is not a dimensional brand, okay? So remember, you want clients to understand viscer viscerally who you are. Now here's a note to you photographers. When you're editing, you choose a wide selection of images. They have to show the whole world of your capabilities, but the specific world of your attributes, right? Not the same thing. Okay, be clear. Now, once you're clear about your attributes, use them in everything that you create and communicate. Because you're marketing consciously, it's important that you work out from your brand attributes no matter what you are doing. What is the project? What is the assignment? What is the market? how you're expanding your market. It always goes back to the center. When you're off center, you usually develop a hate for your tools. That's why people come to me and they say, I hate my website. But they don't hate their website, it's because they're having a problem at the center with their brand. Okay, one thing, thank you. This is an assignment that I give to everyone. I suggest that every day you try to analyze a brand because you're making brand decisions every day. So study brands outside of what you do. Like when you go to the store, why are you buying one pair of jeans over another, one pair of shoes over another, what kind, one kind of tea or coffee over another? You have a sense of what those brands are and why you're engaging with them. Okay, so this is the process. So this is the process that I go through. So you can take yourself through this process or you can always call me. But first you get to the attributes, the meaning, right? The meaning so you can make a strategy. I call this excavation. It's almost, you know, archeological. We get down to the really deep stuff. It's the basis of everything you do in the future. Then you think about your name. If you have a company, why is the name of your company what it is? I have addressed this many in many projects where people wrote their name on the back of a napkin and they said, oh, that sounds great. Or, you know, my husband had this great idea and it's the worst name that you've ever heard. So have a reason for having a name or using your own name. Next is that thing that you guys like to call your logo, but it's your identity. And remember, you have to think about that because it's the symbolic expression of your attributes and capabilities. Then you build your visual brand because we all have a visual brand no matter what we do. So here's some of the things that I would do. You'd, you have to develop photos or if you're a photographer, you need to develop your portfolio no matter what because you need it. You need a print portfolio, you photographers. It's very important. You have your website development, design, copywriting, your marketing pieces, maybe you're doing advertising. I'm giving you just a few ideas here. Uh, then I hear all the time, must I do social media? No. You don't have to do it, but if you make the decision to do it, you must do it on brand. It has to be right for your brand, and then the language you work has to, you use has to be on brand. So then things become on brand, they follow the attributes, or off brand, 
They're not following the attributes, rather than good and bad. Language. This is my favorite part, the language piece, because a lot of times, the first time you engage with someone, you meet them at dinner, you meet them at a party, or you send them an email. They've never seen what you do. They don't know anything about you or your company. So I'm a little bit obsessed with the language piece of branding. So you have to develop communication tools that work in every communication. Because what you put on your website is not going to be what you're going to put in a marketing piece. We have 10 minutes. OK. I'm determined to use all my time, you guys. And don't forget, you need a bio, and that should be on brand. right? Because sometimes people's bios are just excruciatingly dull. And then you have publicity and all of that. And then the brand is something that continues to need work over time. I, I read this interesting essay in the New York Times a few years ago. It was all about this guy who wrote this thing about his garden fence. And he said he had to make the decision to either upkeep the fence and scrape it and paint it, or he knew that it was going to rust and fall off its hinges. So your brand is no different from that. It's not immutable. It's something that you know the attributes, and then over time, you have to continue to work with it. It's not static. OK, and then you're going, one other piece, which we cannot talk about today, is how you open new markets. And how you know, open new markets is through analysis. You cannot open new markets without strategic analysis. We do tons of that. Right, so that you have a clear idea of why you're going forth into a new market and what tools you need and how to communicate in that market. Okay, so one last chart. So there's you and your company. Then there's your communication. So all the things we've been talking about, design, naming, language. So when I say the brand, that's the aggregate of everything we've been talking about, right? Lauren Greenfield's brand, or Adam's brand, or Vanity Fair, whoever it may be. Then there's your website design, language, and how it functions. Maybe you have a product design, or you need packaging. And then there's all of these other annoying things. There's PR, there's social media, there's how you network, there's your collateral, your advertising, maybe you're making instructional videos, or maybe you're a, a videographer. It touches everything. If you keep this chart in mind, you'll be able to manage your brand. I call this sales and happiness. What's the end game? The end game is that you want to be satisfying yourself, but you want to make money and you want to make more money than you're making now, usually. So, the, so part of what you want is, like sometimes I work with people, they triple their billings, or I worked with one guy when I met him, he was making $45,000 a year, something like that. And think about this, so that's like maybe 45,000 euros, and now he makes $650,000 a year. It's not magic. It took him 10 years for that to happen. But it can happen. It's not impossible. OK? So you identify your audiences, you make your message clear, and you must have a marketing schedule, you guys. And you have to stick to it. Right? Marketing cycles are 18 months, even in the world of social media. For real uh, market immersion, it takes 18 months. It's a classic marketing cycle. OK, so here's the takeaway. This is just my giving you a big hug and a kiss when you leave. Remember that you're creating your opportunities based on definition, consistency, diligence, because it's really hard work, and courage. Because the courage piece is the, the piece that I have found to be the defining factor. You, you have to really take it on and be willing also to go out there and be seen as not being perfect. Right? So you have to take risks. And the people I know who do best 
with this kind of work are very brave people. And they can go through a difficult place because when you're defining all of this stuff, it doesn't always feel great until you really connect with who you are and how you feel and what you do. And then you have to get all those tools in order and that takes time. So you have to be very, very patient with yourself as you get ready to come to market in a new way. So we have a few minute for, minutes for questions. You can always write to me. My card is out there. But please, if you have any questions, ask me. Or if you're dying to go have a glass of wine, I totally understand. Anyone? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Everything's so clear. That's great. And I don't even speak Italian. Anyone else? Okay, well, thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. So what I say is you, com you commun learn to communicate with yourself differently, and then you learn to communicate with the market differently. And that will change how your business or your career unfolds. Okay, so why does branding matter? This is, this is a good question, right? So it creates a sense of purpose and focus for all of your activities, no matter what they are. It helps you to communicate clearly and understandably about what you're offering in the marketplace. Now you communicate to yourself and all of your audiences. The thing is, you guys, your audience is not monolithic. It's not one audience, it's many audiences. And you have to learn to communicate with all those people, okay? Now, branding is good because it helps you to increase sales. It allows you to be strategic. It allows you to work from the center out. It helps you to attract and retain clients. So whether you're a freelancer or you have a company, whatever it may be, you have to bring people in the door who are gonna pay for your service, unless you're independently wealthy. So that's another story. But you still need a brand because then you can create something and birth it into the world. Then this final piece, which I think is really important is that it teaches you how to use your resources because we all have a limited amount of resources, right? Whether it's time or money or the people that we work with. So, right, because you can't work 24 hours a day and you don't have an endless amount of money. And sometimes you're not working on your own either. Okay, now I'm gonna show you this really interesting chart so for any of you who are already working, this is going to change your thinking a little bit, I feel, and I hope. This is how your audiences relate to you. Now, most people who I speak to think that your audience relates to you based on your skill. In other words, what you do. I'm a car mechanic, or I own a bakery, or I'm a photographer. That is not how they relate to you. That's not the first piece. The first piece is about perception. It's inner life, it's your history, and your hopes and dreams. And it's the work you create and the work that you do. This is your brand, okay? So it's the first piece. You can't market or advertise or do any of those things unless you have sorted out this front piece. Okay, so when you work from your center, this is gonna be a lot of talking in the beginning, then it'll be really visual, okay? So when we talk about becoming a brand, we're talking about coming from what I call the you of you, your internal essence, and what that is comprised of. And then we're talking about how you run your business, or let's say you're a freelancer, how you run your career. And then if you're a filmmaker or a writer, what you create and how you approach the creative process. Now, your belief systems, in other words, this authentic 
self. It's a combination of your feelings, your psychology, it's analysis, right, because it's deductive, because you have to be analytic in the marketplace. Sometimes it's spiritual, sometimes people are bringing a spiritual dimension to who they are and what they do. And then sometimes it's aesthetic, if you're in the visual part of the business. Can you hear all right, even though there's trucks passing? Yeah, I think it's okay, okay. So this is part of everything that you create, you make, and you do. Now this is what I call learning how to communicate consciously, all right? It doesn't matter whether you're a journalist, a photographer, you have an organization, so you all do different things. So that's what I find so interesting in my line of work. Um, no matter who I work with, whether it's a nonprofit or a food company, or an artist, or an agency, or a photographer, we're always going through the same process, and then the outcome is different. But the process of doing this excavation work is always the same. So I want you all to realize that this applies to you, no matter who you are and what you do. Okay, so by bringing these elements to the surface, it enables you to use all aspects of yourself more consciously and to express yourself, who you are, and then come to market more successfully. Okay. So I think a good way to talk about it to yourself is to have conscious communication. So this is how your audience experiences you and perceives you, your work, and your business. So you guys know what perception is? Yeah. It's not a fact. It's an impression. And sometimes it's right, and sometimes it's really, really wrong. But keep in mind that the way what I'm going to show you is because this is the first piece. You want to be able to have an accurate perception out in the marketplace. In addition, there's the relationship piece. This is what people like to call relationship, relationship marketing. But really what it's about is the relationship between you and your audience. How do you handle the relationship? How every aspect of the relationship. In addition, it's your reputation. What are people saying about you? That can be a painful thing to think about for all of us. You know, maybe people think, oh, that person is showy, or that person's a braggart, or that person thinks they're talented, but they're really not. What, whatever it is that they're saying about you, you need to pull these pieces together in order to handle your brand properly. And last but not least is what you make or do. So do you guys see that's not at the top of the list, it's at the bottom of the list. So it's perception, relationship, reputation, and then it's your category, your skill. Okay, so just hang in with me in getting through the groundwork piece because it'll get juicier as we go along. So your capabilities are what you do. I'll give you an example. A Mac is a computer, and as a company, one thing that Apple does is make computers. In addition, they have attributes. So what is an attribute? Now, I have these shocking experiences where I might be working with someone for a year, and then they come back after a year and they say, what is an attribute? So an attribute is a trait or a characteristic. So a good way to practice this is describe your uncle, right? So my Uncle Joe, he's very funny, he's very loyal, and he's extremely, extremely friendly. I have described his brand. So that, good. Now, I'm starting here because this is an, I'm gonna show you a couple of quotes of people that I've worked with. Now this is an agency that I work with in New York that represents a lot of photographers. And the agent said, there's always room for growth. Why not aspire for greatness? 
Now, someone else says going through the branding process is, um, it's like having a psychotherapist for your career, a chiropractor for your mind, and a GPS, a navigation device for your heart. So another person says, let go of your familiar words so you can understand your mother tongue, your own language. That is what your brand is, your own language. It's an unconventional, unexpected offering to observe your past, your present, and thereby ultimately help define your future. Okay, so tell me if I'm speaking too fast, but we, we have plenty of time, so. Now, every artist wants to grow and be challenged. This is someone I've been working with for years, and he says, or at least they say they do, but it's hard to find the tools in life to continue to make strides and get to the next level. I did not have a framework to understand how my life had informed my work and vice versa. But through this work, I was given the tools and insight to understand and control why I am making the creative decisions that I make. So this is where we're starting, you guys. Right here, okay? So I'm calling this Branding 101, but we're gonna be talking about things at a much deeper level. So what does it mean to define your brand and then bring it to market? Okay, so let's start here. What is a brand anyway? Most people are confused about what a brand is. They think having a brand is tacky, you know, and self-promotional, um, or that brands are only about logos, websites, or social media. Now, I've been asked many times to write a book, but I find books about branding so irritating because this is what people talk about, whereas we're going to talk about what brands are really made of. And you're going to see, while I'm speaking, I'm always going here or here. Your gut and your heart married with your brain. That's your brand. Okay, so in reality, your brand is your voice. It's your point of view. It's your in joke at the beginning, right? So that we're all relaxed, but I think I'll just start. So I'm curious to know, because this is a journalism conference, how many of you are journalists or aspiring journalists? Some. And then give me an idea of what, what else the people in the room do. Do any of you, are you involved in NGOs or you're working writers? Photographers? A photographer? We've got Hazel on Oh, that's a good one. Any other? Advertising. Advertising, good. So you like to know about branding. So this is a little bit of a different topic, and we're going to talk about it in a different way. So that I'm going to take you through kind of the analytic basis of how brands are constructed, right? Because most people are confused about what a brand is. I find that most people, when they call me, right, because I'm a brand consultant and I have a communications business, they call me and they say, my website is not working. I don't like my website. Or they say, my marketing's not working. Or they have all kinds of other things. My social media isn't working. So I found, ah, that's what I forgot. Um, one second. I had, an, I had a couple of interesting conversations yesterday where I was talking about branding and the only thing that people wanted to talk about was social media. So social media is a tool of branding. So first we're going to establish kind of the ground zero of what a brand is about in a very deep way. And then I have a lot of case studies and I'm actually going to ask you questions. So don't, get, don't be afraid. Like, don't be afraid to answer my questions because it will let me know if I'm helping you guys to become good analysts. 
Because in order to build your own brand, you have to learn how to analyze the marketplace. That's the first skill you're going to develop. Okay, and because I'm speaking in American, I'm going to call you all you guys, okay? okay. So. 